Without a round of applause for the first panel, put your hands together, everybody. For these inspiring stories that will blow your mind and make you want to start your own company eventually. The next panel is about India's rising creative entrepreneurs. Our moderator is Samir Bangara, co-founder Qki. Yes, come on guys. Can we have Mr. Samir Bangara on stage, please? And on the panel, we have Prajakta Kohli, content creator, Akib Vani, founder, AW Designs, Nirmika Singh, executive editor, Rolling Stone India, and Tej Brar, founder, Third Culture. Ladies and gentlemen, your second panel for the day. Put your hands together. Sorry to keep you waiting, ladies and gentlemen. Um, th since this is a panel on entrepreneurship, we thought we'd change this up a little bit and do things differently. Um, and so, uh, let me just say that all of the folks on this panel, there's enough information about them on the internet. So we're not going to sp spoon feed you with their life stories because, uh, you know, Prajakta, Nirmika, Tej, Akib, you've, you've done, they've done this enough of time. So hit up Google, you'll find out their, their life stories. We're going to do, you know, it'll emerge in some of the conversations. The second thing is that usually the panels will be about the panelists first, but I'm going to come to you and ask you a couple of questions before we start this, okay? So uh, everyone's awake. If you can raise your hands, anyone. Awesome, okay. Uh, please, the lady who's raised her hand. Can you name your, your, your favorite entrepreneur? I want to set the context of entrepreneurship basically here because we're moving from entrepreneurship to creative entrepreneurship and I think it's important to set the context of who is an entrepreneur, what is an entrepreneur. So uh, the lady who raised her hand, could you tell us who are your uh, role models as entrepreneurs? <laughs> My plant worked, thank you very much. Uh, so, oh. Ambili, I couldn't even, okay, that's not fair. Ambili is managed by QQ. that's not a fair answer. So we'll move on to somebody else. Uh, anybody from this side? Raise your hands. Who's your favorite entrepreneur? India, abroad, anybody? Yes? Gary V, okay. Anybody else? Please? Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, Gary V. So uh, all really obviously successful people. Uh, and, um, you know, to further contextualize what is entrepreneurship, guys, I have a little bit of a surprise for you guys, you know, and it wouldn't have worked without surprising you guys. So we're going to do a, a rapid fire with the panelists, catch them off guard. Uh, and maybe we'll start with Prajakta. Okay, since you are the famous logger, it should come easy to you. We're going to do 10 seconds at best. The three things that... Oh, before that, is this working? Yeah? Hi, everyone. Can you hear her? I just wanted to Thank you. Okay. I said hi. I just said hi. Okay. So, Prajakta, the three things that describe the qualities of an entrepreneur for you, the top three things, go. Uh, I think um, a hard worker, vision, and a great, great, great team. Great team. Hard yeah. worker, vision, great team. Okay. Akib? I think you've got to be a fire starter. A got, fire starter, okay. Yeah. A hustler, mm -hmm. because nothing's easier than that. And of course, a little creative. A little creative? Yep. Okay, awesome. The jacket is awesome, by the way. Thank you. It's it, hand painted. It's hand painted by you, right? Or this Correct. is what you do? Okay. Nirmika, three things, 10 seconds. Nine, eight. All right, so seven. you have to be an incorrigible dreamer to be an entrepreneur. I think you have to be somebody who's always optimistic. Uh, Very important, yeah. And uh, you have to have the will, capacity, and the ability to take risks. Awesome. Tej? I'm going to say uh, responsibility, independence. Sorry, what's the first one? Responsibility. Okay. To your staff, to yourself, uh, your artists. Uh, responsibility, independence, and adaptability. Responsibility, independence, and adaptability. Fantastic. Okay, so, you know, we're beginning to contextualize this, and I think it's, it's important because... The thing is, some of these traits, you could, uh, you know, a plumber and a carpenter is also an entrepreneur in one sense. So it's important to distinguish the context that we're talking about today. I don't want to take away that from them, but the point is, what, do we talk about that? So I think what I want to bridge into this is fundamentally, 
How many Simon Sinek fans in the audience? Start with why? Who's seen the, the TED talk, Start With Why? Okay, uh, just a couple of people. I would urge you to go look up Simon Sinek, Start With Why. It's an incredible, uh, very short TED talk. But I think what distinguishes an entrepreneur is the spirit of entrepreneurship. It's, you know, a great Urdu word describes it as junoon. That junoon with which the spirit with which you start, the revolt, the breakout, the wanting to change the norm, that spirit is what entrepreneurship is. And that's the why you become an entrepreneur. How you do it is starting up a company. So you'll notice nobody said starting up a company. And I'm really happy nobody said starting a company because starting a company is how you do it. And then what the company does is what the company does and that defines the success or not. But entrepreneurship, in my view, and we can talk about it and challenge it maybe in the Q&A, is the spirit of entrepreneurship. So if, if, you know, if you guys disagree, then disagree. But I'd like to bring it back to you now and say, you know, uh, starting with Tej, Talk to us about the why. Why did you do what you did? And, and, and also, you know, in that, you've had a pretty rich experience of working abroad and you were in Tanzania, you were in LA, and then you came to India. How did the travels impact this, the, your experiences impact your uh, entrepreneurship journey? Um, you know, the real uh, honest uh, answer to your question about why is because I saw an opportunity. Um, okay. I saw a gap in the market and I saw, uh, an, a, a very clear niche space that I could occupy and uh, accelerate quite quickly. Um, so that's really why we went into doing it. But very quickly after we started, uh, you know, the company, that's when you kind of realize like, okay, this is how much work it's really going to be, you know? And very quickly, the why becomes your inspiration, but the how and the what becomes your everyday, your practicality Absolutely. of how you have to yeah. kind of uh, handle things and move forward with it. Um, just to refresh that, so this is, the, you, you saw an opportunity in managing talent that was underserved in the correct. music space. Correct. I saw that there was, uh, obviously Bollywood was being very well serviced, uh, there was a huge amount of machinery there already. Um, we had this explosion that was happening in the independent music space, which was not just happening um, on the show side, but also on the talent side. You know, in 2011, when I moved back uh, from Los Angeles to India, I would say that there was a Why handful, probably 50. What brought you back to India? Oh, are you actually, were you born here or were you born? I was born here, yeah. So um, what brought you back? So the company I was working for in LA was run on venture capital. It was a, a, a music startup uh, based in LA that I was working for for two years. And one fine day I walked into work and uh, there was a general staff meeting that was called. Some dude in a suit walks in and he says, hey, you know, I'm Chris, whatever, from Chicago, and I pay all your salaries and you guys are not making the numbers I want you to be making, so I'm pulling the funding and uh, thank you very much, see you later. And, uh, you know, there's me, and I was uh, waiting for my H-1B employment visa to come through. So after 10 years of living in the U.S., I was given 14 days to leave the country. So seven days, I got, I, I, you know, I got somebody to move into my apartment. I sold my car. Next seven days, I went to go uh, stay with a girl I'd been seeing in New York for a while. And then I showed up in India for a cousin's wedding, thinking that I was going to make a pit stop here and then continue on to the UK. My mother's English, and I was planning on going to England and, and work there. But what ended up happening was that this was peak recession time, right? So there's people who are working in the music industry in the UK for like 20 years who were getting laid off. So I talked to some of my partners and my friends there in the UK and I said, look, if I get on a plane and I go to England, is there, is there an opportunity? They said, do not come here. They said, it's not going to happen. Like, this is a really bad job market right now. You're in India. You've got a way better shot there. Just stay there. Got it. I met okay. some incredible um, partners very early on. One of them being uh, Mohammed Aboud, DJ Mo City, who now runs uh, Box Out FM. And he introduced me to my first artist, Duelist Inquiry. And at that point, I kind of realized, oh my God, there's all these kids making incredible music on their laptops all over the country, and they have no clue how the music industry works. And if they try to operate through the Bollywood circles, they're going to get eaten alive. They're never going to make any money, they're going to end up not getting credit, and they're going to end up composing and working on music that ultimately is not fulfilling for them. So I thought, right. okay, we need to set up some machinery that operates outside of Bollywood, and that's what my niche has been. And then when did you meet Nuclear? Was that when you were doing your stint at OML? Uh, yes. Um, so I, in 2011, I worked on... Uh, How Bacardi many Nuclear fans in the audience? Yeah. Ah, good stuff. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I, 
I worked on Bacardi NH7 Weekender uh, from 2011 until 2018. Um, the first two years as a freelancer that they hired, uh, basically to run a stage that they used to have called the Dub Station. So through that experience of working with them for two years, you know, they eventually said, Yo, you seem like a smart guy. I'm gonna guy. come back because I promise people they need to Google you. That's that's <laughs> enough intrigue. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to bore you guys quickly. through the yeah. whole thing. Because that's the why. Okay, so uh, yeah. Nirmika, what was your why? Uh, your background is political science at JNU, the top Delhi college, LSR. You were you were gigging when you were a teenager in restaurants while you were at LSR. I can never figure that one out. But uh, but but what was that journey? Why did you uh, you have this dual personality as a journalist and as an artist? as a singer also uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a writer. So just quickly tell us, how does this all get packaged? Why do you do what you do? Right, thank you, Samir. First of all, thank you, everybody, for you know, being here and listening to all of us. Uh, we're all here to kind of you know, borrow and soak in inspiration from each other. So I'm really happy to be here amongst all of you. I'm going to keep it very brief, very short. Why do I do what I do? I really don't know. I just feel that I have this compulsive need to create, and that's how I describe what I do. I'm a compulsive creator, so whether it was, you know, writing poetry when I was nine years old, or singing, or learning the guitar, or so painting you were my walls. When you were nine? I was actually. Really? Crazy. Do you it remember anything crazy. that you wrote at nine? I don't. Was it, any I, good? it was something patriotic because my parents were, you know, they were those socialist revolutionaries from the 80s, so there was always this climate of poetry at home. So I do remember writing something in my diary and hiding it from my daddy because I thought that if he saw it, he'd judge me and I'd be so embarrassed. So, I, so your I, dad's a writer too? He is, yeah. Both okay. unpublished writers and they, you know, performed in the literary circles in Delhi back in the day. So the creative gene does transfer in DNA? I think so. Think? I never realized it. You know, back in the day, Samir, it's really weird and funny that I was embarrassed of the fact that they were doing Hindi poetry. It's funny that I saw them on national television. I would be embarrassed of it, you know, because we went to a cool school. I was learning, you know, rock and, uh, you know, rock licks at uh, the guitar school that I was going to. So what seemed to me back in the day an embarrassment is actually my biggest asset today, the, the gift of language, the gift of words. Right, okay. So you say you don't know why you do it, but you do it because you have to do it, right? Yeah, because it kind of is intrinsically tied to your, you know, the fabric of who you are. Why do I write? I don't know. This is just who make, this is what gives meaning to my life. And I know it sounds very vague and vaporous when I say it, but that's what, I think that's the reason why probably Projecta feels an inclination to create. That's the reason why, you know, Akib is painting his, <laughs> you know, his jackets. And that's the reason why Tej wants to help artists become who they are. You know, we just feel a compulsive need to do that. So do you think this is, got, this is something you have to be born with or can it be inculcated in any way? It certainly can't be projected. Do you think it has to be innate? You've actually delved into a debate about nurture versus nature. I think it's a combination of both. You have to have it uh, congenitally, you have to have it intrinsically. Of course, you have to hone it to become better at it. So I think that I, if I had the, you know, the hereditary, whatever, DNA of uh, being a writer, I've only honed it by reading a lot, by, you know, being in the company of people who are inspiring. So it's a combination of both for sure. Again, why do I do it? Because I have to do it. Got it. Okay, well, I'm going to jump to Prajakta. And, and then come back to you if you don't mind. So, uh, That's okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to save the best for last. <laughs> so, uh, but so, Prajakta, you know, tell us a little bit because there's enough material out there, but tell us stuff that's not out there as to like, why did you do this? How much of it was random coincidence and how much was it uh, about a desire to do something and then figuring it out and leaving other options that you might have had? I don't know, but um, tell us the why journey for you. I think 100% of it was just like, what? Like, I, I did not see that coming from anywhere. Four years ago, being a YouTuber is not something everyone dreamed of. It's not like, okay, I'm gonna become a YouTuber. It never was like that. For me, I think why I did it was because I didn't know what else to do. When I grew up with the dream of being a radio jockey, I became a radio jockey and a really bad one. Um, so, the <laughs> Um, so that's when I, I was like, okay, great. So the one dream I had is not working out. What am I going to do about it? And that's when YouTube just showed up. And so I literally just did it because I didn't know what else to do. And uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a combination of a very, very random coincidence, but also like trusting the process. I took it up and then best decision ever. 
Right. Do you, can you relate back to now that you've done it in hindsight, uh, things that happen in your life that you can see, oh, now in hindsight, I could see that this is the path I was going to be on. Do you get that sense of deja vu of… All the time. Yeah. All the time. What, Everything what? that I've done, I used to do theatre when I was in uh, college. Okay. I used to dance when I was in school, I used to do theatre in college, when I did radio. I remember when I was doing radio, I used to hate that so much. Right. And I used to be like, I don't know why I keep doing this, I don't know what good's going to come out of it. But now when I have a YouTube channel, I know so many learnings that I took from when I was a radio jockey, you know, everything from understanding the audience mindset, keeping your content crisp, uh, editing, all of that that I learned when I absolutely hated doing it. But now, thanks to that one year I spent doing radio, I have that knowledge. So every bit and every stop I've taken on the way has made 100% sense. Do, do you think uh, one can map this out to detect it, uh, to find that entrepreneur early on? Is there, is there a... Uh, is there a way to predict that in advance? I grew up mapping everything out. So I, I'm a huge fan of the map where I was like, great, I want to write everything down. I want to know exactly how the journey is going to be. But then when everything worked out and still didn't, you know, uh, then reaching a point where I'm like, oh, okay, so I'm going to let this take a turn of its own. So I think uh, it's great if you have a plan, but even if you don't, it's not that much of an issue, I feel like. Cool. Okay. So, Gurpreet, you know, I'm trying to figure out, can we templatize this in our businesses and discover it? But uh, I don't know, it's still a little random. And in fact, I like the fact that you can't predict it, right? If it became predictable, how boring would our businesses be, right? So, but... Also, okay. we go with the platform, right? And the platform is not predictable at exactly. all. Exactly. Nobody exactly. saw this happening two years totally. ago. So, we can't yeah. see where it's going a year exactly. from now. Exactly. And now the TikTokification of video. <laughs> That's another thing, <laughs> another panel. But, uh, Akib, yes. what's your story of why, man? So, I and always... just for, to refresh it, because, you know, yeah. we were all introduced when we were not even in here. So, uh, you do this, uh, you, you design this, you're a musician. Because all your pictures online are with a guitar. Yeah. So, you're a musician. So I've, yeah, I've been a musician, that's how I started my journey. Then, a magazine approached me because I used to design artworks for bands, all of that, t-shirts. Worked for a magazine, became the art director, uh, which is also a partner here, which is RSJ Magazine. And then later, which then I turned it into uh, designing spaces. That's where I began designing weddings. So I've worn many hats from designing uh, artworks for bands to designing interiors. What took you to designing weddings is just that you were designing spaces and somebody hits you up one day and says, cool stuff, come design the Ambani wedding now for us. That kind of happened as well, it. yes. Right. So. Yeah. How much so, did you make on that, by the way? <laughs> Let's yeah. not talk numbers Sorry. right now. <laughs> just asking, okay. So it was yeah. always about creating things and right. giving it back to the community is what I felt, you know. Like right. there was always something that I would like doing, but how are you giving it back? So there was always a need, like Tej, you know, mentioned, like, you know, there is a need for things that they need to happen here. So obviously, like, I would see that bands aren't doing as nice artworks, the videos aren't as great, the restaurants aren't looking as nice as they should as compared to what's happening in the West. Similar in the wedding space. So, similarly with the jackets, in fact. So, you know, let's just keep on creating things. So, as the day progresses, there's something that one or the other I would like to just keep on creating. So, it doesn't matter, is it a wedding or is it a music festival stage that I'm designing? Right. So, I think, the, if you really think of this, uh, creative folks, uh, and, and you know, if you really go back in history during the Renaissance, and let's maybe not go that far back, but creative people are actually the original entrepreneurs because the revolt and the changing the status quo musicians, poets, you know, uh, everything that is a form of expression is... Uh, so, I guess along the way we've grown to learn of entrepreneurs as successful businesses versus actually people, again, the spirit of entrepreneurship is, is the most native, I feel, in, in creative people. And so if you even think of, you know, somebody said Elon Musk, Elon Musk and Steve Jobs, in my mind, are more creative entrepreneurs than, let's say, in my view, uh, a, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and uh, uh, Steve Barmer or, or Bill Gates, who are a lot more business entrepreneurs. But, you know, that's why, you know, Elon Musk wants to make a, a home for human beings on another planet. That doesn't come from being a business entrepreneur. Uh, you know, things like that. So I think they are far more uh, in the space of creative entrepreneurs. And so I think the creative entrepreneurship, therefore, is interesting. And creatives are the first entrepreneurs. Now, we've got another 13 minutes left, and I promise to give at least, uh, you know, five minutes for q and I do want to touch upon one thing that I, I was, you know, dodging in my mind whether we should or not. But um, 
with creative people, there is a sense that in the creative business, there is a deeper uh, occurrence of mental health, depression, and challenges of that nature. And uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of the uh, the 27 Club, also known as the Forever 27 Club, um, of you know how a lot of famous musicians, most recently Avicii, Amy Winehouse, Jimi Hendrix, uh, several, who died at 27. And uh, there's you know there's several research that talks about mental health in creatives. Now the thing is, if you if if you ever see the the docu on Amy Winehouse or uh, Billy Eilish, who's uh, won multiple awards of late also, the, the sorrow and the depression actually results in their creativity. And so how, do you really want to disengage the mental health issue or the depression from the creative process? Would you agree that this is something, uh, and this is such a deep topic, but I just want to touch upon it because one is it's rampant, and it's not talked about enough, but do you get the feeling that the feeling of uh, I haven't done enough or being uh, or a feeling of loan is part of the entire creative journey or as entrepreneurs as you as you all have become uh, you are able to fight that and that's really not on your radar. Nirmika? Um, very important question Sameer, thank you for bringing uh, you know this debate up. Mental health and creativity, I think it will be uh, wrong to say that mental health issues are only endemic to the creative community. You know, some of my peers are still uh, pursuing their PhDs, you know, people, folks from uh, JNU. And I know that uh, mental health is as big an issue there in the academic circles as it is here. So I feel that, uh, I mean, it's just my understanding that any, um, any sort of work that requires you to, you know, to place a premium on uh, creation in solitude can probably lead to a lot of, uh, you know, internal miseries, just my observation. Of course, it's not to say that when you're in a team, these things don't crop up. But I've seen that the one quality, if I had to, you know, the one commonality, if I had to, you know, string together among different communities would be that uh, um, creating stuff from scratch, doing stuff in solitude, being the being a you know a lone ranger, uh, a one person army. These are you know some of the things that I see say among uh, PhD candidates or people who are making music in solitude or you know bedroom producers, singers, writers, poets. You know any sort of creation that requires a lot of self driven nature also leads to a lot of you know grappling with issues that are also internal. So I wouldn't say that it's endemic to our community. It's a rampant thing. Of course, it gets heightened and more talked about because of course, it's a glamorous field. So if Amy Winehouse suffered from you know depression or if she was showing up drunk on stage, it got talked about more than say my friend who's pursuing you know, a PhD degree in Oslo and has a paper presentation in Norway. So, so you're saying it's not something that is uh, more uh, deeply associated with the creative arts. I mean, when you write a poem, uh, you know, uh, that is sad, are you actually going through those emotions or about love? Are you going through those emotions? Are you able to just bring that out uh, without actually going through those emotions? Well, it depends, right? It depends on the work at hand. If I'm writing a poem for myself, of course, I've gone through that emotion because you want to keep the, you know, the, the, the aspect of sincerity and honesty intact in your poetry. But if it's commissioned work, then I can induce all of that and get those emotions out. And I think that's, that's the quality of being a professional uh, writer, poet, uh, songwriter. Who'd like to take a stab at that? Prachakta, Also, um, I feel like things are slightly different today because now these conversations are more public. Right. For is that the a good thing, right? Yeah, which is an amazing thing. For the yeah. longest time, these were very hushed conversations where nobody tells anybody that someone's suffering from depression. But yeah. now people are actually, thanks to the digital platforms, people are actually coming up and saying things and feeling things and now being heard, which is sort of helping. And when it comes to being a creator, I think one thing that personally for me uh, has worked a lot is having a circle that helps you right. grow and uh, keeps you grounded at the Have same you ever end. sought inspiration from sorrow? From? Sorrow, from, not, from not feeling yet, low? Not yet, no. Okay. I'm right. an annoyingly happy person all the Fantastic. time. Fantastic, so. all right. <laughs> Akib? Well, your design <laughs> certainly don't reflect anything that is uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm all about <laughs> color, so. <laughs> yeah. The message is to spread color, as always. Awesome. But, okay. uh, I know, like, you know, it's, it is an important topic to touch, and it's always important to share stories, so people also kind of relate. So once you, tell, okay, even I'm going through things and they see, okay, you're also coping up with it. So that way, okay, people see some but hope. But do you think it's more rampant in creatives, yes or no? 
Well, no, not okay. really. All right, all right. It's Tej, you work with artists. Um, I, I was actually just thinking that, um, you know, I'm not uh, really well placed to say if it's more prevalent in entrepreneurs. Um, but in creatives? In creatives, uh, I'm not going to say that they're pre more predisposed to having it. Okay. What I am going to say is that out of the roster of artists that I've worked with over the last eight years, almost every one of them has had some episode um, that they've had to go through. Um, to some to a greater degree than others. Yep. But what I feel is that in, the, in, in creatives, what it does is it's important to have that. It's important to go through that. Yep. And what ends up coming out as a result of that is some truly incredible art, right? Because they have to move through that in order to be able to close the, the chapter to and, and turn the page. Yep, yep. Right. So, um, you know, some of the... I mean, I'm not going to get into the artists and the records, but of some, course, of the, yeah. some of the records that are the best known here, uh, that I, everybody in this room would know those songs, um, have come out as a result of some, some real life turmoil, you know? Right, um, right. So uh, I'm not going to say more likely, less likely, but I am going to say that it's important and uh, all of the artists that manage to get a hold on that come up with something truly remarkable um, uh, on the other side. Got it, okay. Um, in the next two minutes, uh, I want to touch upon the final aspect before we open it up to the audiences, which is a big part of entrepreneurship is, is failing. And the thing is that entrepreneurship is so romanticized and you know, you always talk about the successes that it's easy to fall into the trap and then when people attempt being entrepreneurs and maybe they don't succeed in the first six months, one year, two years, they think that it's, you know, they're always comparing to somebody else's journey and they don't really think about that they've spent maybe 10 years, 15 years, five years doing something. There is a theory about doing something for five years. I'm sure some of you are aware of that, that it takes at least five years to become perfect at anything. And so that would be the minimum time I would suggest that anybody give themselves to become entrepreneurs. Five years is the minimum time. Now, if you can afford it or not is a different matter. But talk to us very quickly in two minutes, if we can run through the panelists, uh, your, uh, your failures and maybe very fast uh, how you dealt with that. Did that make you stronger? I'm assuming it did. Projecta. I've always said this, um, one thing that I really, really live by is trusting the process. Every time I have hit a roadblock, um, I, I've reached now I've reached a point where every time I see a roadblock, I'm like, ooh, okay. <laughs> because every time I've hit one, I've come out of it learning so much more than I Tell knew before it. Um, in 2017, I think I hit a major content block where suddenly my content went very stagnant, the channel wasn't growing, there were no views, there was no reach, none of that was happening. And I reached a point, I love making YouTube videos, okay, it's one of my favorite things to do ever. And I reached a point where I was like, you know what, I can't do this, so I'm going to stop making videos and maybe I'll explore something else. And uh, the one good thing I did at that time was that I didn't stop uploading content. Even though I didn't enjoy it as much, uh, it was not great content, but I didn't stop making content. And I had this one video which I had written. I was like, you know what, I'm just going to make this one video and then I'll stop the channel. I made that video and that video blew up. And then okay. the next one blew up, and then the next one, and then So the determination, because you don't know the success is around just the yeah. corner, so the determination, yeah. big part of being, you know, an entrepreneur is the, yeah. the, the grittiness. Yeah. Uh, Akib. So, I've never had formal education in design, so, you know, it's nothing that I've learned, it's something that I've always had it in me. I've failed in school, I've never completed college, so, you know, this is not something I That learned. sounds so amazing now, right? I'm sure it was hard I going know, through right? that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, the idea is, obviously, not to give up, just keep on going. And like I keep telling people, my peers, you know, it doesn't have to be something that you read in the book. Right. Like I tell people, like, you know, it's a lot of hustle that it goes uh, to, you know, get to, you know, what your dreams are basically. So, okay. That. Uh, Nirmika? Failure. I don't know what to say. I say it's self-preservation, ego, swart. I don't care for failure. I ignore it. What is failure? I don't know. Actually, I can't say it in my own way. What is failure? I can't tell you. Were you a topper in school? Sorry. I know you went to LSR and then JNU. So I can I see where that went. I know you're hopping on about it, but yeah. yes. Um, but yes, I can talk about uh, my biggest learning. My biggest learning uh, came to me courtesy my best friend who's here, somewhere here. And, uh, so last year I had this uh, discussion with him where he made me realize uh, the difference between my calling and my hobby. So I think what I was doing was I was chasing a dream that, uh, that, that which wasn't playing to my strengths. So this was the biggest learning. I was writing songs, I was performing, I had this full-time journalistic career and I realized 
realized that the biggest thing that I needed to do then was to play to my strengths. Or playing to my strengths tha, writing. So, you know, I've had a band, a successful, I would like to believe band for like 10 years and I was performing and I loved doing all of that and I loved being on stage. But I was really playing to my strength. What was really my strength was writing. I think I found that now and I couldn't be happier. So, that's my biggest thing, learning. I can't say that I can't I think, uh, I think, I think, uh, usse zyada learning hi hai. Thank Give you. A big hand to your best friend, then if he's here or she's here, please stand up. But uh, anyway, awesome. Um, good on you for the, having that, Tej. Man, I think it's pretty simple. Like, um, a big part of being an entrepreneur is taking a risk, right? Yeah. When you take a risk, either it's gonna pay off or it's not gonna pay off. Right. The ones that everybody gets to know about are the ones that worked, right? The ones that nobody ever talks about are all the ones that went south, right? So, you know, I, I don't want to take you through a laundry list of all the failures that we've had, but I think it's inherent to being an entrepreneur, you know? If you're going to do something of significance and something that has real impact, um, something that you really believe in and you put your reputation behind it, you put your finances behind it, you put your staff behind it, uh, you all work towards a goal and then it doesn't come to fruition and it fails, that should be looked at as a learning. It should be looked at as what could have been done That's differently. Perspective, yeah. why, did I, why did it not work out for me? So I think that you know, if you are an entrepreneur or you're thinking about being an entrepreneur, just understand that everyone is not going to work. You are going to have those losses. And I just wanted to touch on one earlier point about that nature versus nurture thing. I totally don't agree that entrepreneurs are born with something special in them. I think every single person in this room has the ability to be an entrepreneur if they want to. I think it comes down to where do you see an opportunity and are you confident enough in your skill set to okay. be able to do it? You could have worked at different companies, been an employee for 10 years, but if you see your niche and you are confident in your ability to pursue that and actively work towards that goal, I think every single person can be an entrepreneur. Super. I don't uh, think there's anything special about, on about that entrepreneurs. Note, Nirmika, I want to put you on the spotlight one last time before we open it up to the audience. Do you have a poem for us on entrepreneurship? <laughs> I like how he's testing my entrepreneurial yeah. skills right now. I like right surprising now. my panelists. Come on, we don't to have much time. Karna ye bhi karte ho aap, hai na? <clears throat> um, a lot of uh, times I'm asked, you know, aapne bhi pucha aaj ki aap kyo karte ho? Why do you do what you do? Right. Over time ho raha hai? Isle mein poem bolne ka... ki if jurat kari ho. Pishli ba, pishli ba panel mein aap the, mein thi, projecta thi, aur mein jurat kari poem sunane ki, to Anurag ji aagai, band kariye. So I hope that Go doesn't happen today. Um, quickly, um, हम लोग क्यों करते हैं जो हम करते हैं और हमको क्यों पसंद है ये जिंदगी थकान भरी आंखें सुकून भरा दिल हम सब की आंखें थकान ही है सब थके से ही रहते हैं तेज भी बोलेंगे आप भी बोलेंगे एवरी मंथ यू नो हसलेंग एंड डूइंग वर एवर दे कैन सो थकान भरी आंखें सुकून भरा दिल थकान भरी आंखें सुकून भरा दिल शिद्दत भरे मकाम छोटे मोटे काम जो भी हम करें छोटे मोटे ही समझते हैं कुछ भी चल जाए चाहे हम लोग एक वीडियो ये बनाएं या फिर वो करें तो मैं सोच रही जो भी हमारा काम है कोई बड़ा काम नहीं है छोटे मोटे काम है थकान भरी आंखें सुकून भरा दिल शिद्दत भरे मकाम छोटे मोटे काम ए प्यारी जिंदगी शिकायत कभी करूं अगर ए प्यारी जिंदगी शिकायत कभी करूं अगर ए मुश्किल जिंदगी शिकायत कभी करूं अगर तो फुर्सत वाली जिंदगी की मुझे सजा दे देना धन्यवाद फैंटास्टिक थैंक यू एंड विद दैट इफ वी गॉट अ कपल ऑफ मिनट्स कैन वी टेक अ कपल ऑफ क्वेश्चंस एट बेस्ट ओके या वी गॉट परमिशन टेक अ कपल ऑफ क्वेश्चंस एनीबॉडी या गो फॉर इट गो फॉर इट या प्लीज जस्ट गो फॉर इट आई 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 कैन हियर यू आई रिपीट इट इफ यू वांट So you already have a great team. <laughs> so the question is, if I can say, how do you make a great team? Is there a template? I, I think uh, the, first, the, the first point is, be very clear about what you're looking for. Understand who you're trying to partner with. What is the responsibility that you want this person to handle? So once you've identified the roles that you're trying to fill, that will make your life a lot easier. 
right? In terms of identifying who can fill which role. I also think that a lot of it has to do with, um, I mean, I, I, I know this is not a technical term, but the vibe, you know? Are you vibing with this person? Do they understand where you're trying to go, you know? And is there a shared synergy there between what their path is gonna be and what your path is gonna be? And if those two things align, that's where you've really uh, got something. So I think be clear about what you need and understand whether that person is on the same wavelength as you. Also, I feel like uh, it's a great way to judge a team. Like, you wouldn't want people around you who always agree with you. You wouldn't want right. people to be like, do this, do this. You don't want that to happen, so I think, yeah. So you want people to challenge you. And if I may just add to that, uh, I always tend to hire for initiative over capability. So, uh, and I know that, you know, oftentimes you're told you must hire the A-team. In uh, If you're doing a startup, the A-team will desert you at the first sign of... Uh, the A-team is usually a uh, mercenaries, and for a startup, you need missionaries. And so if you only hire for the A-team, they will desert you when trouble comes. So initiative... And you can teach expertise. And I think that, that, that sort of solves for that. But yeah, any other question? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, of course, yes. Whom is that question to? Whom is that question to? Is this, okay. So the question is for your how secure would you feel as an influencer to plug in potential competition? Would you do it for money or would you turn it down? I don't understand the question. Are you saying that are we are we are we endorsing? Are we? Are if you're asked to right plug now? in a poet in your poetry, would you do it? I would do it with all my heart. I mean, I that's what we're doing right now. Collabs. <laughs> YouTube collaborations. It's more of a collab than a we plug in, I think. We have bills to pay. You have bills to pay. Yeah. Okay. You have. So I think the, the overarching answer is yes. Some for the money, some because that's the way we it is. We do it for views and content. Yeah. Okay. My only feedback on that. Satisfaction. Yeah. Creative satisfaction, of course. That too. Yeah. Yeah. So the answer is yes. Yeah. Samir, I think we're last. Ambali. So, sorry, we just go do one more. Yeah. Ambali, go ahead. Got it. Can I summarize for you? How important is it as an entrepreneur to delegate versus do everything yourself? And if you if you are actually a creative entrepreneur, you may not have that team. So how do you delegate? Take a crack at it, Nirmika, because you've got a team. You've got a company, man. That's right. I Let have the a... people who are doing it themselves take that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. How important is it to delegate? Of course, you got to delegate. If I'm involved in the core art of creating, I cannot be bothered with every day. Although I've done it for pretty much all my life. Uh, be be. Bo Of course, you're stating the obvious here. I mean, should I be aware of how you're uh, the invoice captain of that is sent? Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Am I the person yeah. doing it every day? No. So you have to be, I feel that, that, that if you're an entrepreneur, you have to be absolutely clued in on every aspect of running the little business or the little enterprise that you're creating. And that's what Are makes you, you an entrepreneur versus just a creative, I would say. Yes. The difference between that. Yes, yes, difference. Yes, okay, yes. on that happy note, uh, thank you very much. We're going to close this. Sorry, can we take that offline before we get... Uh, yeah, if you have the time. Uh... Oh, no, that, that's good. We can, we can chat okay, afterwards. Awesome. Well. Thank you very much. Thank you for being a great audience. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, awesome. Thank Thank you, you for everyone. having us. I'm completely flipping the way in the presence of Rani Kohinoor. I, I like was just going fan. to say, I think uh, when someone asked uh, about collaborating with other artists, I think, put your hands together for Prajakta. I think she's collaborated <laughs> with more people than people living in Bandra West. And that's a lot of people. Thank Put your you hands so together and I love you, I love you. <laughs> okay, this, we should do backstage. Okay. <laughs> wow. All right, thank you. Let's give a round of applause. What a fantastic panel that was. Incredible indeed. Whoa.